Chapter 43 deals with behavioral or animal e ecology. Um, basically, what is behavior? Uh, behavior can be described as an action that is carried out by muscles or glands under control of the nervous system in response to some sort of stimulus. So you know that a characteristic of life is that as living things, we respond to our environment, and then those responses are caused by stimuli. Ultimately, using muscles in the throat or chest, you can produce song. Uh, releasing a scent to mark a territory, uh, such as uh, releasing pheromones, um, that is a type of behavior. Uh, carrying out a mating dance to attract a mate for the reproductive success of your uh, general species, that is a behavior. Um, behaviors themselves can and will be selected on by natural selection. So remember, uh, natural selection is a process that helps drive evolution and bring about uh, these changes ultimately uh, through DNA, but we see behavior being both that of a genetic base and that being of both environmental influence. Collectively, an animal's behavior is the sum of its responses both to external and internal stimuli. Um, the study of animal behavior itself is called ethology. Um, basically, there are four questions that an ethologist would ask. One of those would be, one, what stimulus elicits the behavior and what physiological mechanism mediate the response? Two, how does the animal's experience during growth and development influence the response? Three, how does the behavior aid in survival and reproduction and four, what is the behavior's evolutionary history? So these are four questions. Um, as we do the animal behavior lab, I want you to be thinking about these things when we're working with our, our bugs in class. So each of these questions does have somewhat of a meaning, and you'll see in the next page. Um, this is where we come in with proximate or ultimate causation. Uh, proximate causation would include questions that we see uh, that animal behaviorist asks questions one and two is the whole how aspect. How does a behavior occur or how is it modified? Um, is it an immediate or is it a learned behavior? Remember learning, any type of learning that occurs, um, learning happens because of behaviors or things we do through our experiences. So was that behavior an immediate or a learned behavior? Something that has been brought about over a period of time through experiences. And then there's this idea of ultimate causation. Um, an animal behaviorist, ultimate causation questions would be like those addressed in the four questions, questions number three and questions number four. Why a behavior occurs in the context of natural selection. So here we get to think about is it an ingrained behavior or is it subconscious? This ultimately brings us to things called fixed action patterns. These are some abbreviated FAPs. Um, fixed action patterns, they are a sequence of unlearned acts that is essentially unchangeable and, once initiated, usually carried out to completion. Ultimately, the response there, uh, the trigger for a behavior or a fixed action pattern is a sign stimulus. And you can see this, uh, it talks about um, FAPs. Let me quick open the book here. FAPs are discussed on pages 820 and 821. So you have a sign uh, stimulus, which is a trigger for the behavior. Um, ultimately, uh, instinct learning, um, imprinting, uh, these are all triggers, but in the in the book, in the beginning there, when it talks about the fixed action patterns, it talks about male stickleback fish. And, and what you see here is the male stickleback fish, you see the male stickleback fish here on the top, and then down below you see replicas of, of what a, a stickleback fish might or might not look like. Um, ultimately, the gray stickleback fish here, when pre presented, to the male stickleback alive fish, um, the male stickleback will not attack um, the realistic gray model. 
However, the male stickleback will attack any of the other four models that have the red belly hair. Ultimately, uh, what it is seeing there is that this grayish one would represent that of a female fish. And down here, male stickleback fish having red bellies would represent a, a male. Um, so in defense, the male is going to attack these models with the red stomach because it assumes that it is another male stickleback fish. Where here, it would welcome or not attack the female uh, true replica of what that stickleback fish looks like. So that is a fixed action pattern, um, and there would be some sort of trigger there in the environment, another male species. And here you can see that uh, uh, accounted for a little more here in the diagram. So the male stickleback fish with a red belly, bluish white back, um, the female stickleback fish with a grayish green body, swollen silvery belly. So uh, be sure that you do read over in your book um, as you go through. Know like instinct and learning, what imprinting is. Um, it talks a little about goal pecking behavior and, and then some social interactions with uh, classical conditioning, associative learning, and operative conditioning, operant conditioning. Um, the next big topic is movement associated with behavior and this is where kinesis or taxis comes into play ultimately a kinesis is a change in an activity or a turning rate in response to a stimulus it's a random movement until the proper condition is met um, you will see kinesis uh, ultimately uh, occur during our, our lab um, there, there will be no direct pattern seen with the movement of pill bugs or the sow bugs. Uh, you will see them moving around um, in random patterns. So that's a, a kinesis type of response. The reverse end of that is what we call a taxis response. And a taxis response is an oriented movement toward or away from a stimulus. Um, that movement is a direct movement either toward or or away from that stimulus so we, we would say it's like a linear movement there and ultimately you could have a taxis that is a uh, positive taxis so a positive taxis is going to move towards a stimulus or a negative taxis is going to move away from a stimulus and we could think of some taxis uh, you have um, phototaxis and plants and phototaxis and plants would be uh, a positive stimulus where the plants are going to grow towards sunlight. Um, you also have chemotaxis, um, whether it's a chemical, so chemicals are chemotaxis. Um, if the chemical is something that is desired, then the organism would move toward that chemical. If the chemical taxis is something that's undesired by that organism, it would move away from that stimulus. So that would be a negative taxis. So those are examples of taxis. So kinesis and taxis. And we're going to see more of kinesis in our animal behavior lab. But we will learn other taxis, um, forms of, of, of the uh, positive or negative taxis movement in class. Migration, ultimately, uh, migration is a regular long distance change in location that is observed that is observed in a wide, wide variety of birds, um, fishes, and other animals. Um, in your book, it talks about uh, migratory patterns for the starling. Um, and you can see that in, on page 823. But uh, migration, these birds are going to travel long distances. Um, a person that would study birds is an avian biologist. So avian biologists that may have interest in this would study the migratory patterns of European starlings. Or you could talk about the migratory pattern of the monarch butterfly or salmon fish migrating up the ri rivers from the seas uh, for laying eggs and mating. So how do they do this? How do they know where they are? Is it the sun? Well, there's problems with that because the sun, um, it could be a cloudy day. The sun changes position. Um, 
throughout the day. Also, you have night and day. So they use this thing called circadian clocks. So some of it is this circadian clock mechanism. Uh, they also use uh, possibly the North Star, but there is problems with that. Uh, Polaris, uh, not always available. Um, so where would that come into play? You have magnetic fields. Some of them do pick up magnetic fields. Uh, this is uh, when we look at um, renewable energy sources like the, the windmills that they're putting up, uh, they're thinking it's disrupting the migratory patterns of some bird species, um, whether it be that it's uh, disrupting the magnetic fields of those mi migratory patterns or hurting them in other ways. Uh, behavioral rhythms. Uh, these are things that you'd look at such as time of day, uh, the time of year or season, uh, the tides, if you're an ocean or a, a, uh, uh, a creature living in an estuary. Um, moon phases, they do have an effect on behavior of animals, um, especially when it comes to uh, reproductive behavior. So these are all types of behavioral rhythms. Um, such a behavioral rhythm, a circadian rhythm of behaviors like sleeping, eating. Uh, circannual rhythm behaviors include such things as hibernation, mating, uh, and I think in the book it talks about the fiddler crab. Um, the fiddler crab, that's discussed on page 我们讲到了飞鸟的鸟，飞鸟的鸟，我们讲到了飞鸟的鸟，我们讲到了飞鸟的鸟，我们讲到了飞鸟的鸟，我们讲到了飞鸟的鸟，我们讲到了飞
cross-fostering. Influence of cross-fostering on male mice. So here's the answer. Cross-fostering study. A study where the young of one species is raised by another to determine what behaviors are learned and which are genetic. So species that were included in this particular study was the California mice um, that were raised by a white-footed mouse. And then you have white-footed mouse uh, being raised by California mice. And as far as aggression towards the intruder, the California mice that were raised by the white-footed mouse was reduced. Um, the white-footed mouse raised by the California mouse there was no difference. As far as aggression in neut a neutral situation, um, the California mice raised by the white-footed mouse had no difference. The white-footed mouse raised by the California mice, we saw an increase there in a neutral situation. And the pattern behavior, California mice paternal, I mean paternal behavior, uh, the California mice raised by the white-footed mice, it was reduced and the white-footed mouse raised by the California mouse, we saw no difference there. So you would introduce a species into uh, a different population of mice into the California mice, and then take a California mouse and introduce it into another form of mice. So genetics. Ultimately, genetics can have uh, bearing on behavior. Um, genes have been found to affect many aspects of animal behavior, including uh, songs of flying insects, variations in migratory patterns seen in some birds, prey selection in reptile species. But ultimately, the root of most behavior, what is the purpose for it? Increase individual survival and reproductive success. So that brings us to mating systems. And mating systems is what ultimately your book is going to end with. Um, give you an idea of reproductive strategies and fitness um, with mating. So most species are promiscuous. Some are monogamous and others are polygamous, where the member of one gender is going to mate with many other. Ultimately, you have two types of polygamy. If you're having a male that is mating with many females, that's polygyny. And if you have a female that is going to mate with many males, that's polyandry. Altruism, now we get to the individual fitness part. Altruism is a behavior that reduces an individual's fitness. So you could have altruistic behavior there. So no examples of these as you go through your textbook, as you complete your, your guided reading sample. Um, we will do uh, a, a discussion of this as we go over our, our, our reading sample of chapter 45, 43, and I'll pull out key things that you should know um, in regards to uh, behavioral ecology. Thank you, and have a nice day.